If I asked you which animal has one of the most impressive bites in nature, you'd probably go straight for the big guns. Maybe lions or pandas or orcas. Maybe even some of the extinct titans like T-Rex with its bone-crushing jaws or ocean monsters like Megalodon. But what if I told you that one of the most impressive biters on Earth was this little fella? This is a betong, a cousin of a kangaroo that weighs no more than an average laptop, has a skull that's no longer than a credit card, and yet can somehow crack open seeds that are in fact so tough it takes more than 100 kilos of direct force to break one open. That's like a human being biting into a coconut. But a coconut with a shell that's an inch thick. So how exactly do these pint-sized marsupials pull off one of the greatest feats of biting prowess known in the animal kingdom? Well today, I'm going to take you through what we've discovered so far. Dr. Rex here. Welcome to the Scullywag Lab where I break down the bare bones basics of skull science. Today, I'm going to introduce you to a quirky family of truly remarkable little marsupials. Betongs and potteroos belong to a family of diprotodont marsupials called the Potteroidae, a lineage that split from the ancestors of kangaroos and wallabies around 20 to 25 million years ago. The seven species around today live kind of like some of the species of ground squirrels you see around. They don't just go around eating grass like kangaroos. Instead, they go after nutrient-rich, highly digestible foods, kind of like the foods people eat. We're talking things like roots and tubers, fruits, nuts and seeds, but also insects for their extra protein and a lot of truffles, which are underground fungal fruiting bodies, a bit like mushrooms. But there's one food in particular that uh, takes the crown. Meet the seeds of the Australian sandalwood and the native Australian peach or quandong. They belong to the same genus, santalum. They're probably about 20 millimeters, two centimeters, two thirds of an inch across, and they're really hard. I sent these to a colleague of mine, Associate Professor Justin Lettiger from East Tennessee State University. He's got a mechanical properties tester that he usually uses to test the properties of primate foods. Justin's measurements indicated that these shells are harder than cherry pits and popcorn kernels. But it's not just about how hard the material is, it's also the structure. The Quandon seed in particular has a shell that's several millimeters thick, so it makes them a real challenge to crack open. These shells, in fact, are so solid that the seeds inside struggle to germinate on their own. If you buy some, the instructions will tell you to crack them open before planting. Anyway, when Justin first tried using his machine to crack a Quandon seed, it maxed out his 1000 Newton pressure plate. That's around 100 kilos or 220 pounds of direct force. He couldn't believe these little pot of roads were getting into these. I mean, the skulls aren't much bigger than a matchbox, but two species of potteroids do, somehow, crack these shells open to get at those tasty kernels inside. That's the brush-tailed betong and the burrowing betong. And there's almost certainly no way that animals this tiny can generate anywhere near a thousand newtons of bite force. So how exactly do they do it? Well, let's take a look at some of their various behaviors and habits, as well as some of their adaptations, which help make this possible. Firstly, these animals are hoarders. Betongs are known to bury these seeds all over the place in random little dugouts. This behavior is called scatter hoarding. We wondered if this had any influence on the seed properties themselves. So we tested the material properties of dried quandon shells, but we also tested fresh shells after stripping the outer fruit away. And we found some interesting results that we published in this paper. Well, it appears that as quandon shells dry out, they get stiffer, but they also get less tough over time. Why is this relevant? Because a stiffer material is easier to crack than a tougher material. From these results, we suggested that maybe the scatter hoarding of these seeds isn't just about long-term storage, but it's also kind of a pre-processing that makes them easier to crack open. Next, let's take a look at their biting behaviors. But you know what? Sad to say, there's not a huge amount of information on exactly how they go about breaking into these seeds. To my knowledge, there's no detailed descriptions of the nut cracking behaviors in the burrowing betong. We just have several papers saying that they scatter hoard them and that they do eat them. But this one obscure paper from the South Australian naturalist does provide some details of the nut cracking behaviors for the brush tailed betong. 
It describes careful manipulation of the seed with its hands and biting with its cheek teeth. It also mentions that considerable effort is put into the task. And it also includes this nice little image here of all the different kinds of nut casings that the beton can crack into, including almonds, macadamias, and yes, quondons. It's just amazing. But you know what, it doesn't appear that there's any clear footage of them completing the task either. This clip here is honestly the best I could find. I think it's from the Arid Recovery YouTube channel, which is a really cool group of people, you should check them out. As you can see, very tactile, and it does indeed appear to be trying very hard, squeezing its tiny little eyes shut and everything. <laughs> Just a bit cute. What is interesting is that there appears to be lots of licking and mouthing of the seed involved. My pet idea for this is that it's carefully selecting places to bite the seed and using its tongue to feel out little micro fractures it makes in the shell, kind of the way people use their fingertips to read braille. Eventually, it's able to create enough micro fractures and in all the right places for the shell to pop right open. This is a bit like cracking a safe by finding that winning combination. This is a nice idea, but it all needs way more research done. So, what about the skulls? Do the skulls show any signs of bite force adaptation to help crack into these super hard seeds? Well, as it happens, our team of researchers, led by Madison Randall, have just published a paper looking at exactly this question. And we did in fact find bite force adaptations in the two species of betongs that crack open these seeds, but they weren't the same adaptations, which was a really interesting finding. The burrowing betong has the shortest face of the whole genus. This is a common feature of hard biting animals because it increases the mechanical advantage or leverage of the jaw. And in another recent paper, we did indeed show that the burrowing betong has very high mechanical advantage indeed. But the brush tail betong was different. It didn't have a shorter face than the other species, but it did have a different premolar. And as we saw in that footage before, these are the main teeth that are used to crack open these seeds. These P3 premolars are often pretty obvious in lots of different diprotodont marsupials. In betongs, it's the main site of most of the initial slicing of foods. You could think of them as similar to rodent incisors. They're a bit of a Swiss army knife that they use for everything. So the premolar of the brush tail betong is positioned further back in the jaw, and it also has a deeper crown. These changes offer more leverage to this tooth, but also make it more like a built-in chisel. So it appears that this species is more adapted to focus its premolar biting to a very specific point along the jaw. This species also experiences less stress during biting, which means it probably has thicker deposits of bone in its skull to handle the higher forces of cracking the seeds. So, in other words, we found that one species has a more efficient skull and the other species has a more reinforced skull. And these are really interesting results because this isn't a case of convergent evolution like is often discussed in evolutionary biology, but it's instead a case of something called many-to-one mapping, which is essentially multiple solutions to a single problem arising independently. And we found this happening at the genus level, which is pretty crazy. So here's the million dollar question then, why so different? Why haven't both these species evolved along similar trajectories to be able to perform the same task of cracking open these seeds? Well, we suggested this might come down to differences in the rest of their diets. The burrowing betong has a diet mostly consisting of harder items like roots, tubers, seeds and brows. These kinds of foods naturally encourage more robust and efficient features. But the brush tail betong has a diet of 75% underground truffles, and it has to sniff these out. Now this paper by the legendary Blair Van Valkenburg shows that a shorter face can reduce the amount of nasal passage that is committed to sensing smells. So it might just be that the brush tail betong simply can't evolve a shorter face because it needs a good sense of smell for finding truffles. Again, these are just more ideas that we need to explore further. So I don't think a lot of people outside of Australia have really heard of these cute little marsupials. We even had one reviewer of one of our papers say that they're a uh, hilarious but certainly appropriate lineage of mammals. <laughs> 
So it's been a fun journey bringing them and their uh, talents into the research spotlight. They need all the help they can get because they've been absolutely hammered hard since the arrival of Europeans, with many species and populations wiped out already. But they're super important for biodiversity and we want them to stick around. So the more people that know about them, the better. Anyway, if you like skulls, like and subscribe. Catch you in the next video.